Those of you who are here can see that it doesn't take a large crowd to get into the storytelling mode. Uh, we look forward to welcoming others uh, next week. I'm nine years old and I'm going on my second flight ever to Colorado. My uncle and his wife and his, their two babies live out there, so my family has decided to take a week to camp and travel and explore Colorado. I'm very excited. My dad has everything figured out. He has this huge duffel bag with all our sleeping bags and the tent and the camp stove, and we fly with all this. Back in then, you could, you could bring a lot of stuff with you. Mm. And my sister and my mom are there too. My sister is just about to turn seven because her birthday is in the summer, which is really cool because we end up having a lot of travel stories to tell for her birthdays. And one of the first places we went was the Garden of the Gods, and it was a really cool place. There was just like huge orangey red rocks. I remember these camels like kissing, and there was this really cool balancing rock that was really amazing. And I didn't know that nature could be like this big and open because I'm from New England and nothing is this amazing. We go on and we also see the Rocky Mountains, which is really cool. There's snow in July, and it's amazing. And we get to see the Continental Divide, which is also really cool because we, I didn't think about like this whole country that's out there and how, wow, one side is going Pacific, the other side, the water is going to the Atlantic Ocean. But over the trip, my parents would be like, oh, there's another really cool lookout we're going to stop. My sister and I in the back seat, we just say, no, we just want to go to the campground. We just want to go to the pool. We are tired of all the sightseeing. <laughs> and we, we really do enjoy our swimming in the pool. And we do keep going and we see also we get to Four Corners, which is where Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado meet. And we take cool pictures all in the four states at once and we explore Utah and there's these Arches National Park, which is again, more just like beautiful red rocks, like these arches that are super thin and they're just eroded in time. And I remember going on one of the hikes and my mom and my sister, they're like, oh, it's too far. But I'm like, dad, let's just keep going to the next arch and we get to it and it's just so cool. That night we're walking again to another pool and all of a sudden, my sister, she just starts like screaming and I don't know what's going on. And I turn around and she had fallen into this like random pipe that was on the ground. And she's just seven years old. She's super skinny, tiny. Like I don't even think a regular person could fit in this pipe, but somehow she managed to. And my mom goes like, go get your dad. So I just run back to the campsite and I'm like, Dad, I don't know what's going on with Diane, but she like cut her leg and he like drives up and gets her and we have to go to the hospital. So this trip has turned, has taken quite a turn. <laughs> and I just remember like sitting in the hospital waiting room and there's the Brady Bunch on and I'm thinking, that's great that they have all these siblings, but I have only one and I really hope that she's okay. And she is, she has this pretty big cut and she's so skinny that they don't put any stitches in it because they don't want to like her leg skin to get pulled in too tight and she's fine like she's just joking about it she's like oh yeah the doctor gave me this kit of tools to like cut it and take care of it and it's almost like I'm like oh that's cool that you got those and the campground when we get back is they have filled that pipe in with sand immediately. And I remember they gave us free ice cream. I was like, oh, that's nice of them. Um, and my sister, like, she's fine, but she can't go to any more pools for the rest of the trip. And my parents are like, no, you cannot use those fancy scissors and gauze. Like, to her, she thought they were really cool. But luckily, the trip ended up being really amazing. We saw some amazing geological features and then we did continue on to see my uncle and my whole cousins and enjoy the 4th of July and yeah I'm just really happy that I have my backseat companion that I've gone on many trips with and 
My sister does have a scar to this day from that, but it was worth the trip. <laughs> my name is Griselle Venegas, and my travel story kind of starts with my own journey. Um, about a few years ago, I became more like a health coach. I, I wanted to help people just lose weight and feel really good about themselves. And within my own journey, I was able to lose 55 pounds, which is phenomenal. Uh, but a few weeks ago, I found myself in a little bit of a rut. I lost my job. And I was like, well, what am I going to do now? What can I do? I want, to, I want to better myself, both mentally, physically, spiritually. So let me start on some walking. And throughout the springtime, I started going to the Quinnipiac River Trail. And it was really awesome because it was really just open. And there was, well, at first, there was no greenery. So you could really see everything, which was really great. Um, as, a, as a woman, I guess, for safety reasons, you know, you could see everything. But then springtime came around, everything started blooming, and the trees came in. And then as I started doing the trail, I was like, you know, this is a little sketchy now. It's a little bit unsafe. I feel that I want to bring some people with me. So I probably about a week ago, I think it was a week ago, someone had warned us about a bear on the trail. And I think I got warned like three times. Um, that there was a black bear, and it was still far away from where I was, but someone just said bear, and that was pretty much enough for me to turn around and, and come back the other way. I wanted to finish my walk, and I was really upset that day that there was something that stopped me from going just because I was by myself, and then I also had a really bright red shirt on, and I looked like a complete target. If, if a bear happened to see me, I could just see it charging towards me. So I decided, let me not do this walk by myself anymore. So I got on our, on our Wallingford um, community page, the pos Positively Wallingford page, and I just wrote on there, let's, let's go for a walk. Anybody want to go for a walk with me? And I am so thrilled about the feedback that I got from it. I, first of all, I can't believe how many people are home during that time, during the daytime, <laughs> that are able to come at 9.30 in the morning for, come for a walk. Um, but it's almost like I feel like in just in a couple of days, it's kind of like blown up a little bit. And from a little post, I've been able to just, there's about 40 people now that have said that they're going to come at certain days, certain times, um, which just to plug it in right now, we're doing Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 930. We're going to meet at the Quinnipiac Linear Trail on Hall Avenue. And Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're going to do it at 6 o'clock. The only reason why I even started doing the night ones was because my name on Instagram is Griselle No Excuses Guru. I don't want to hear any excuses, so when someone said, oh my God, I, I really would love to do this, but I work all day. I can't do 9.30. No problem. We're doing 6 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So there's no excuse why not to come out and, and come hang out with some awesome ladies. We did it on Monday, and we did it today, and we talked the whole time. It was really wonderful. We talked about our kids, our job, Wallingford, you name it. It was just really it was nice. It's nice to, to meet women in our community. It's nice to share our stories um, about how we love being here, how, um, you know, everything from, from politics, a little bit of politics, to, to, to basically butterflies. Today was the conversation, butterflies. Um, so I really would love people to come in the community to come out and join us and come up for a walk. And I'm really on a mission to make everybody healthy and happy. So we're going to start. We're going to start with doing a walk. Does anybody have an expanding question that can go deeper into this really phenomenal experience that yeah. we just heard? I mean, this is the kind of story we really were looking forward to hearing from the community. A community story that mm -hmm. has to do with who we are. How far do, do you walk? By myself, I can do the four miles, which is two miles one way and then mm -hmm. two miles back. Um, but we all have different strengths, so we're trying to take that into consideration. So I just want to do an hour. So wherever we are, half hour out, I look at my watch, we'll turn around and come back. I, I told the ladies um, today that we'll work on our stamina. So if anybody wants to walk a little bit further, then let's figure out where we are, and then we'll remember. So the next time we'll push a little bit further to, to walk a little bit farther. To reiterate, where do you guys meet? Oh, at the Quinnipiac Linear okay. Trail. It's on okay. Hole Avenue, right oh. by where the new um, entrance is. Oh, yeah, we're talking Parkway. about. Okay. Yeah. And it's free. It's completely free. There's no charge. There's no anything. <laughs> I got clearance from Wallingford to, to do it as well. So was this your first time actually experiencing the trail when you had this idea about doing the walk or were you familiar with it from before? I never used the trail up to 
during springtime I did a couple of times when everything was not grown in. But I lived in Wallingford um, five years. I've mm. never used a trail before. I think maybe out of safety. I think that's one of the main things is yeah. that, you know, you're a lady, mm-hmm. do you, you know, sometimes I don't want to be that one person that posts somewhere that something happened to me because I was walking by myself. So mm-hmm. that's a, a big push why I want to do it together with other people. And are you aware of the ticks that there have been reports of ticks being uh, on people after they've walked the trail? Not just with those with animals in general. Really? And some very, very little ones. So are you yes. actually incorporating checking each other for ticks at the end of the walk. We did. We did. We all oh, stopped wow. and we checked each it's other. Fantastic. So, yes, I guess I haven't had any problem. I've been there quite a few times. Mm-hmm. I haven't had any problems myself, but I've heard a lot of people as well say mm. that it's been on their pets. So yeah. it's always a caution. I mean, it's a precaution everywhere we go nowadays, I feel. But I haven't had any issues yet. Well, what was your largest group of ladies? We've only done it two days. Today's my oh, second wow. day. So today we had five people. Oh, Well, okay. there's 40 people all together that said they would be at certain times. Oh, great. Yeah, you, didn't you post your picture on Facebook? We I did. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I want to be able to add different things later on as well. So, like, I like to run. I'm not a great runner, but I like to, maybe if I had a partner, I'd be a little bit better runner. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping to add maybe a weekend day where we can expand and, and do something else or meet even earlier to do maybe some strength training, do some other things besides the walking. How do you all manage water bottles or water? Do you all carry an individual we water do. pack? Yeah, we each carried our own water bottle in our hand. In your hand. Or so just kind of casual. Or a little, or... Like, uh, little backpack. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm Helen. And uh, last summer I went on a trip to Italy, my third one actually. But this time it was with my stepson and his family and Angelo, the boyfriend. <laughs> and um, we had to do it in the month of August because of the kids and the fact that they couldn't take more than a no, week or so off from school. So we had over two weeks in Italy and we traveled, started in Naples and we uh, went to the Amalfi Coast and we went to uh, Tuscany and Rome and it is beautiful, but hot. I do not recommend Italy, any part of Italy, except maybe the mountains in Tuscany in August or July for that matter. The thing that got to me was when we were in Venice, and Venice is everything they said, you know, it's it's a gorgeously decaying city. And we took a gondola ride uh, one morning. We wanted to get out before it got too hot, you know, and enjoy the gondola ride. And I have to say, it was just like flowing, you know, you're, you're rocking gently. And even when I got off the boat, I was like still feeling that. I was feeling so relaxed and everything else. So we're walking around, and they tell you Venice is a city to get lost in. Lots of little alleyways, which is great if it isn't 95 degrees out, Mm -hmm. but it was. And so, um, you know, we wanted to go back to our Airbnb, and we kept taking wrong turns. And (laughs) we, um, we had our phones with us, you know, the good old GPS, and we're walking around, uh, and I'm yelling at Angelo. I mean, I was Mm -hmm. so hot, I was pissed. Mm-hmm. I get too hot and I get very cranky. <laughs> and, and he took it, you know, he got it, you know. Um, but at one point, we're walking around with the GPS, we're trying to, uh, is this where we're supposed to be? And there was another couple coming along the same way, and they were doing the same thing, you mm-hmm. know, and we looked at each other, you know, it's like we just had to laugh. We didn't, no words had to be exchanged. They were just as lost as we were and laughing about it. Because what else are you going to do? except try to find someplace air conditioned and in Venice there aren't too many buildings mm-hmm. like that anyway or at least commercial ones so anyway uh, we got back eventually you know I think first though we stopped and got a glass of wine I felt I needed one of those right on you know, overlooking the Grand Canal that was lovely and then we made our way back to where we were staying so I could cool off and feel normal again so that was my little adventure in, <laughs> in Venice <laughs> But it is a gorgeous city. I do recommend mm-hmm. seeing it before it completely falls into the sea. Yeah. <laughs> you had mentioned this was your third trip. So of the three, is there something that stood out more in this one? or I think because different? we got to see a little bit more of Italy, like a, an extra long weekend, if you will, because the whole thing was so sudden. And I didn't even have a passport. That was an adventure. Oh, yeah. And this was before internet, any of that stuff where you could book flights or, mm-hmm. or anything. 
And we kept calling Alitalia Airlines, and the prices changed every time you called. Yep. I needed to have a passport picture taken, and at that time, remember the movie theaters, they had the camera things, you could go in the photo mm -hmm. booths, and so there was one in, in Meriden at the time, I thought, well, maybe this will be good enough. It wasn't, it wasn't the right size. Yes, mm -hmm. very picky. Yeah. Right across in the passport office happens to be a photo studio. For a price, you get your picture taken. And then I had to take that, and then went into the line in Stanford, and um, for snaking around, I finally got my passport. Meantime, Angelo, our friend took Angelo to New York to the Italian embassy to get his passport. Then he came back to Stanford to get me. I was just getting out of the office with a passport in my hand, and I get accosted by a, um, a, a news reporter for WCBS radio. They had, because of the government shutdown, she was asking questions about, I don't know what the heck I said. I just babbled something about, you know, the sh shutdown and blah, blah, blah. I was gone. We were on our way to, you know, Kennedy Airport. And we did finally get a flight. It was on standby. And it was a pretty good, it, considering the time of year and all that, I think it was, uh, round trip was like 600 something, which wasn't bad. And I brought up my brand new credit card that I had just gotten to <laughs> broke it in getting, <laughs> going to Italy. <laughs> So that was memorable in itself, just getting there. Mm -hmm. We did get to see Pompeii while we were there in that trip. I think, you know, each trip, you know, had its own set of um, points of interest. If you I know. don't travel much. I would start my travel story with, do you travel very much? Do you travel very far? Because most of my travel is in daydreams or vicariously through others. In fact, Facebook gives us a vicarious world of others, but that's not the vicarious I mean. I mean I have a family member that travels. South Africa, Samoa, Europe, the various United States locations, lives in New York City, but the travel moment that felt a little bit more personal than vicarious happened when the tsunami hit American Samoa and the communications was out for more than 48 hours. And there was no way of knowing what happened to that small island. The sad story of the small island is that the emergency system is not up to par. And what happens during the emergency signaling on that small island, the smallest island of Samoa, because there's multiple islands and he was on the smallest, is that all of the folks on the island literally go from the low side of the island to the mountain side of the island. And they're dispatched up to the mountain side. And they I've grown up with this being an occurrence and they know what to do. But during this tsunami, a school bus was on the lower side of the island and it did not make it, the notice. And an island with a community of 600 people losing a school bus of children has a tremendous impact on the community. Life-shattering impact. So living vicariously through my traveler is not always great stories. Some can be very sad like that one. He made it to the top of the mountain and he could tell how he was on the back of a truck and it was bumpy and um, the people that were in the truck were very glad and clutching each other and glad to be making it up the the mountain. So I don't travel very far. I travel through others. But I hope that in tonight's telling of travel stories, we get to hear travels that you've actually taken, or maybe stories you've heard from others of their travels, if we go that far. Um, we define travel very, very broadly. So it can be pretty much anything. Anyone has a travel story, and anyone in Wallingford has another chance.
to share their travel story or another chance story on June 19. We look forward to seeing you then. And I will now leave the stage and someone else will come up and share about travel. The story goes all the way back to 2011. I'm Cambodian. I was adopted from Cambodia when I was 11 months old by two uh, white parents. Uh, both my parents are white and so is my sister. And I didn't really know anything about my birthplace. So uh, they wanted to bring me back there. So when I was older, obviously, when I understood what had happened. So we went back. It was a 48 hour plane ride because we go over the national eight line. In actual time, it's 24 hours. But when you go over it, it turns into 48 hours. So that was a drag. We landed in Seoul, Korea. We had a five hour layover. We ended up sleeping in the airport. And then we got to Cambodia at one in the morning. So we go into the hotel. It's one in the morning. It's hot. It's humid. I'm tired. I'm 11 years old. I don't know what's going on. My parents keep telling me, oh, you're in your home place. Like, this is where you grew up. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I guess. But I'm, I don't know. So we... Uh, so the trip continues and then they come up to me when I'm next to the pool and they're like, we're going to bring you to where we found you. And I was like, what? <laughs> and they're like, uh, clarification, we're going to bring you to the orphanage that we adopted you from. And I was like, okay. We ended up going in something called a tuk-tuk. Um, it's kind of like, you see them a lot in Asian countries because they look they really like motorcycles so it's a um it's like a it's like you're basically in a box being towed by a motorcycle so we're all crammed into this tuk tuk i still don't know where i'm going my sister doesn't know where she's going she was sick the day before so she's like i don't really want to be on this bumpy road right now so we're going along and then we i see the orphanage in the distance this is in siam reap there's the orphanage and i'm like okay, this is where I'm from. I still don't understand because there's like, basically the orphanage was just a building, like a big dugout building in the middle of nowhere with a couple little other buildings around, but there were, those were, I've later found out those were the homes for the people that work there. And I was like, <coughs> okay. So we get closer and then I step out of the tuk-tuk first because I'm the smallest so they stuffed me in after all my bigger uh, family members. I just see all these kids start running up to me and I still didn't understand because I don't know my language which is Khmer and they were all yelling hello in Khmer at me and I, a little 11 year old me was like, I still don't understand. <laughs> Why did my parents bring me here? And I know they were really just trying to show me this is where you came from. You have a culture and a heritage that um, that you should understand since you're older. And um, we went to the orphanage, uh, which again was a dugout area. We were kind of just standing in the middle of a pavilion. And then I see the hanging baskets that I saw from the pictures that they used to show me that I used to sleep in for the one year before they found me. There was no one in there because all the kids, Asian adoption has gotten really, really tricky. So they can't really just take a kid off the street anymore and bring them into an orphanage. Every orphanage has to be like, for lack of better terms, like sanctioned, like under the government now. Like when I was found, they could just bring me in and then they bring in the government and be like, hey, this is a child that could be adopted. So there was no newborns in, in the baskets. There were all like the older kids that were like my age still there. And I'm walking around and around and these kids are still following me <laughs> and talking to me. And I'm like, still don't know what you're saying. And they, they're trying, I think they were trying to say, hello, my name is. And like, uh, where are you from? Why are you dressed like that? Cause I was dressed like a Westerner. They were, they, had the t-shirts and like the pants but I was really dressed like a westerner I had that big logo shirt on and just like the, the jeans and everything and I was like I don't belong here but I do this is where I grew up 
So then again, my parents kept trying to explain to me what happened, why I'm here, and why these people are talking to me, and why these kids are trying to say hello and like play with me. But it, like, the whole experience was kind of really, I don't it was eye-opening, but also when I look back on it, I learn more now as I look back on it than I did when I was in that situation. So that was, that's me. Wow. Wow. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You said your sister was with you and she was feeling sick, but sh is she a younger sister or an older sister? She's an older sister. Older sister. She's 24 years old. So in relationship to you, since we don't know how old oh, you are. I'm 18, so she's about five years older. About five years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was not found? No, she was <laughs> conceived <laughs> by my <laughs> adoptive parents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. She, um, what happened is since I was born there, I have immunity to the water because the water is contaminated a little bit it's like <laughs> if you grow up drinking the water then you have uh, immunity to yeah it. so my sister didn't have that cause she grew up in the states so she ended up I think she ate or drank something that was made with the water mm -hmm. and um, she ended up getting really sick the next day mm -hmm. and she, uh, one of the um, what is it called the workers at the Pavilion, which is the place that we were staying before we went to go see the orphanage, um, nursed her back to health because she was really sick and it wasn't a good, she actually got sick like that twice because she wasn't careful what she ate mm -hmm. or drank. So I was the only one who was, uh, who was able to eat the pesto because they washed the leaves with the, with the water and she really wanted to eat the pesto but we kept telling her that she couldn't. She just ate, ended up eating <laughs> rice porridge for the rest of the trip, which was really sad. Have you an interest in going back? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, as an inspiring producer, I really want to go back to Asia and um, see how music has evolved there. Mostly mm -hmm. um, South Korea, because there's the huge entertainment place over, um, over in that country mm. uh, with like K-pop and all that, not just necessarily K-pop, because I know it's like a, a big giant thing and like oh, there's so much <laughs> stigma around it and everything, but there's also like, there are artists over there that I would like to work with. What is the government now in Cambodia? Mm, um, now, I know when I was there, it, w it was more open than it is now, yeah. but I don't really like, keep track of what happens in Cambodia because I'm so <coughs> caught up with what's happening here where I'm living. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to learn the language now? I've been I'm trying sure. to, but like the, <laughs> the dialect is really, really hard. The only thing I know how to say is hello, which is susade. And even, that's not even the accent you're supposed to say it in. Like that was a Spanish mm -hmm. accent, like a Spanish-based accent because mm -hmm. I, I know Spanish. <laughs> is that the, the word that you remember the children saying to you, susade? Um, my dad learned a little bit of Kamai when I was there, so the only um, one I recognized was Susade, which is hello. Um, we visited a couple temples around there. Um, there's one that was featured in Tomb Raider, mm. and it's the one with the big, huge trees that just come over the top of the temples. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's called Taprom. Uh, that was actually a Cambodian accent. <laughs> but. That's the only thing I know, <laughs> because I heard them say it all the time when we were there. They're like, oh, there's taprom, there's taprom, and I'm like, okay, okay, yeah. we're here. But a lot of the motifs from Cambodia are there at the temples. Um, so we have something called bas relief, which is um, basically like imprints and engravings of dancers mm. that we have, and um, they're all, it's kind of like if you think of like, hieroglyphics mm -hmm. but 3D that's basically what they are so you see them all along the side of the temples and then you get further into Siam Reap and 
uh, you see they're more like overgrown and stuff and you see like Buddha heads sticking out from the ground and it <laughs> it's it's beautiful mm. so and obviously there's the one that's on our flag which is uh, Angkor Wat which is in Nam Pen, okay. but that's the one that's always flooded with tourists as people taking pictures. Of. We liked the going to Siam Reap better because um, there weren't a lot of people around and I actually got to, probably shouldn't have done this, but I climbed on top of one of them <laughs> and my parents got scared. <laughs> How long were you there? Uh, we were there for about two weeks, I think. Give or take, shave off the traveling time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Give or take the forty, the forty-eight mm -hmm. hours on oh, yeah. each side. <laughs> okay. Any other expanding mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah. so much, Sona. Mm -hmm. awesome. Oh, I meant to say, is Sona um, a Cambodian name, and does it have a, a translation of any kind? Uh, yes, uh, Sona is actually Hindi. It's not Khmer. Oh. So it means song or gold, um, depending on how you say it and what dialect. So. Nice. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa, and I do have a story about traveling because for the very first time I traveled to Europe not that long ago. I've been to Mexico, I've been to Bahamas, I've been to Jamaica, but never to, to Europe. And it was my first experience flying by myself, mm. number one, mm. and flying out of the country by myself, number two. So that was a um, pretty big deal for me. I wasn't nervous, but I was, really, I knew I had to be prepared for that part, and I, I think I was. Finland was an experience, even the airports were an experience. Getting to be around people that spoke another language, luckily for me, most people there did speak English. I absolutely was not a normal tourist because the purpose of, of being there was kind of to follow around a friend who was performing. So it was a lot of running around and I got to watch some pretty nice performances and meet some great local people and friends. Uh, my friend who um, and got to experience real Finnish culture in the homes of people that live in Finland. We were in Helsinki, so it was um, the, the capital. And the only, I'd say the sightseeing that I did was running by places, with um, one exception of getting to spend a, a nice chunk of time at the National Museum. So I learned a lot about Finland. I didn't know it was as young of a country as it is. It was it's 100 years old, mm -hmm. and the history was pretty fascinating. I'd want to go through it all again to retain, <laughs> retain more, mm -hmm. but um, I was really excited to be there. There definitely was a different feel. We didn't go to any restaurants. I think we had um, a food truck experience, which was good. We were hungry on the road. And luckily where we stayed was very close to a market. We were able to purchase local food. And um, lucky me, I was with someone who was a good cook, so things got put together when we were hungry, kind of on the run, but um, again, another experience, you know, real Finnish food. The sights, getting to just walk around. I, I took a lot of pictures as I could, just kind of stop for a minute. <laughs> Some pictures, I, I like pictures of windows and doors of old architecture, so <coughs> there was plenty of that. There's not one part that was my favorite, but it really was an experience to be in Europe. It's very hard to explain because here, and I was told that, that, it, that it would be like this, um, and here our, our buildings aren't as old and there's, there's just a, a feel in the air. We were very fortunate weather-wise. We were able to, we, we did public transportation and, and walked and we really lucked out the weather was nice, unseasonably nice. It was the week of Easter. But um, I'm looking forward to going back again and met some great people. And um, it was my, my first Europe experience, and I'm definitely bit by the travel bug. So that's <laughs> probably my most exciting, most recent travel story. And that's it. Thank you. Unless you have questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
Can you expand on the food more? Mm. We we like bought cheeses and mustards and a lot of fish put together. Too, isn't it? I've heard that again. We um, we didn't do any restaurants. We didn't do any major cooking. It was really just kind of on the. So next time, that's that'll be mm -hmm. something a priority to to do some restauranting. But it just it was a really busy week, so it was kind of going by the by the hours what we what we could do when we could eat mm -hmm. healthier, definitely healthier. The history you mentioned it's only as a country it's only a hundred years old, right? So is there what what was a part of one of the other Scandinavian countries at one point? Do I'm you not going to get this right, but I know that there was. Sweden, I believe at one point it was part of Sweden and at one part it was part of Russia okay. and there were squabbles over. World War One. That's 1919. There were two places where I saw um, actual bullet holes from mm. a war that had gone on, you yep. know, fire that was exchanged. I made it a business trip. One of the meetings I had was with a skincare company. Because I'm an esthetician, and I'm like, well, wherever I go, I'm like, well, what do they, I wonder what they do for mm -hmm. skin care. And I did some research and found a company. It was, about, it was an hour train ride outside of Helsinki. And the reason I was really excited about the product line, because it, it was organic and toxic-free, which is always a priority to me. But learning about the environment, um, the pristine water, mm -hmm. the clean air, the no GMOs, allowed in the country, so the plant matter material mm -hmm. that was used to make the product line, I just imagine that it would be everything that we can get in this country as far as the quality and the purity mm -hmm. of a product, um, and even better. And mm -hmm. that was um, a really important part, really exciting part of the trip for me too, it was the last day, the afternoon we spent at, at um, the factory and we got a little tour of how they made the products and met the owners, which was really sweet. I felt that it was a healthier place, mm -hmm. even, I want to say in spirit, there's just something about the, a calmness. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time there, and we didn't get really to see the countryside, and uh, I didn't meet a whole bunch of people, but a lot, and everybody just, I was, I was in the company of somebody who was very loved, so the people I were, got to meet and spend time with were very upbeat, nice, friendly people too, which was nice. Um, but overall, a healthy place, some place I would definitely like to see more of and spend more time at. My name is Tom. I have a travel story. And Finland is involved. The fanciful nature of my story is I got home to my home in Connecticut from Finland on three beams of light. It took three beams of light for me to to work out the logistics of uh, moving uh, about eight amps, nine guitars, uh, seven, sold two, uh, a household of all my, all my belongings to sell a car that was not going to make uh, a final international, another international trip. It had been in uh, three countries. And so I had to get rid of a car. I had to <laughs> move all my stuff to uh, back back home to Connecticut, and I had to get a flight. A one, I was always told a one-way ticket is hard, hard to get. Um, sometimes more expensive. So I literally uh, could not muscle mind it. I that was the term I was going to use. I had been, I've had it, it would, it was my fifth international move. I had been with a pro, uh, a diplomat, who had arranged these things and orchestrated them and also had the government pay for them. So it was uh, not as uh, difficult. It didn't have the component of figuring out for yourself and paying for it. Um, but I had some experience with the four moves, uh, enough to realize that I didn't have the wherewithal to muscle mine through it. So I imagined three beams of light. One, selling the bimmer. Two, getting my guitars and amps, and my, my household home, and three, getting that flight. In an order of importance, they all had to happen. But I imagine just as beams of light coming down and braiding, literally intertwining, coming down in my head, and then some magic happening. I don't know. I couldn't figure it out. I wasn't doing <clears throat> I wasn't going to muscle mind it. So uh, this was May of 2015 when the decision was made. June. Uh, it started, uh, the light started. Um, 
It turned out that September was going to be the time to move. For whatever reason, uh, it just fell together like that. Coincidentally, I was uh, imagining that my uh, application for um, a residence, uh, a permanent residence permit, uh, it was at the time, but I knew I wasn't going to be living there permanently. It was time to come home to the hacienda, to the family house for a bit, so that was cut and dry. But it was nice to, to think of uh, the uh, residence permit. It did come and it gave me a uh, uh, lifetime residency uh, two weeks before I moved. I found out that I could stay there forever if I wanted. Um, and collect on the, t on the wonderfully horrendous socialist uh, benefits. The safety net there is amazing. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the, the time spent uh, from June to September was a mix of imagining the three beams of light, paralyzing fear, and three Three, three moves that, uh, <clears throat> paralyzing fear and just moves that happen by themselves. The, the explanation for of that is, uh, let's say, the first, the first beam of light. I decided on a Monday evening to check for, in June, to check for a flight. A one-way trip, against all that, uh, one ways are so hard to get. I managed to get one within two hours, and of course, as we've, we've heard earlier tonight, the, the prices change as they know you're searching. The search engine knows that much about who's, uh, who's doing what. So I realized within this two hours, I have probably got at 310 euros the best flight that I'm ever going to get internationally. So I jumped on it. <clears throat> in between uh, panic, uh, frozen in panic, they were inspired moves. That was the other thing I was looking for. So the, the other term, the uh, online within two hours, the flight was settled. Uh, I decided to be uh, cheap and take a layover for that, uh, a 10 hour layover for the, uh, for the cheap flight. I could have spent a little bit more and not spent 10 hours in London, but I had never been in London before outside of Heathrow, so I thought I was going to spend some time walking. Of course, you know how that is on a layover. You get Ten hours, <laughs> one and a half hours was spent doing that, and it was still, it was okay. But that was beam of light number one. Beam of light number two, how am I going to get my, my belongings home? I put out four requests, five requests, to the moving companies of the, in the area. In the area, of course, these are international companies. Within, uh, within Finland, though, I had a choice of at least five. And no one got back to me, uh, save for one, which uh, was in the interim, I was speaking with a friend, uh, an Australian who's been living in Finland for a couple of decades. And he happened to mention that he uh, had worked on a website for a moving company, a very small one, uh, but he thought the guy was conscientious. And it, as it turned out, that was the only one that had responded, the, uh, one out of five. To my inquiry. So I had a good feeling at least about the connection. So I went, went with that. From that point on, it was a machine that went by of its own accord. Beam of light. Did your thing. <laughs> Still trusting because this is all just arrangements until the day of or the weeks of. Um, the car. The car was a very nice 316i. The BMW doesn't sell cars with engines that small in the States, but uh, we got it in Finland, moved to Germany, broke it in on the Autobahn, brought it to Washington, brought it back to Finland. It was not going to come back with me. It was staying in Finland this time. But how to get a Finn to buy a car with the yellow engine light, which in huh? Finland means bring to the dealer and pay the 2,000 euros. <laughs> Um, when a Finn <laughs> will not go against the red light on the street, they are very observant of when they're told what not what to do and what is important. I did manage to find a buyer, obviously, uh, but uh, too too soon. Let me. Uh, I was still dr dealing with that beam of light. I was cleaning the car. 
uh, weekends. Uh, here I was taking one end at a time, the front <coughs> engine compartment. I just lost myself in detailing it. The interior, another day. The trunk, on another. On the final day, a weekend, that I was uh, getting ready to clean it up to take pictures, to put it on the net, the call came in an hour before I went to take pictures. I had a buyer for the car already. Someone I knew, um, I, a, a, a working colleague, but and that, that conversation had been going on for a couple of weeks, but all of a sudden he needed a car, wanted it then, and he made the call this just an hour before I was uh, getting the car washed to go take pictures. So on that third beam of light, it happened, and all in due time. That was in September, within, uh, within about two weeks of my leaving. So I had use of the car up until it was time to sell it, and uh, everything else moved on its own accord, starting from May, uh, June, to September. Three beams of light got, what, got me to where my mind, muscles, or without could have never, never done. Thank you, Light. <laughs> and thank you for your patience. Anybody have ex expanding questions like um, what happens when the lights turn off or the application <laughs> for being a finished resident kind of expires or is it still something that I have can a car. be cons you have a card that says eligible to be a fin man? <laughs> the card says you must spend six months or more in Finland each year. So on, in, in 2016, I violated that. Mm -hmm. So I... I'm no longer. No longer. Uh, I'm not persona non grata because I got back in a, m a month and a half ago. Oh. Okay. With another story killer. <laughs> uh, yeah, Finland is, uh, is, is the topic tonight. <laughs> Any questions about Finland? <laughs> it's a lovely place, place to visit. And grass-fed dairy is... Mm. Denmark, for example, they're known to be the happiest country in the world. Where does Finland rate with that? They've been superseded this year, uh, 2018 possibly, by Finland. Really? <coughs> Finland, or maybe they've got a new metric, but the uh, all over the Facebook internet memes and internet memes is Finland is rated the happiest country. Hmm. However, as I, when I lived there first in 2002 to 03, they also had a distinction of having the highest or one of the highest rates of suicides. Mm -hmm. Also, they were the, the least uh, corrupted country by, by whatever standard decided yeah. to, to... Finland had an interesting combination of high smoking rates, mm -hmm. high gun suicides, drinking, but I imagine. a lot of drinking. Um, drinking is involved in the culture very heavily. I know also known teetotaling families as well mm -hmm. uh, in Finland, but yeah, three o'clock on a finish uh, on any given weekend on a finish mm -hmm. night is a, in town is quite a quite a noisy thing. Like in the winter, how short are the days? Is that what you're trying to say? Oh well, they're like they're about Alaska sixty six uh, mm -hmm. in latitude. Oh, okay. They're kind of like Minnesota and above. So take that for temperature. And uh, I traveled. Uh, I did work in theater uh, for, and did some road work. So I traveled within the Arctic Circle and within thirty five kilometers of Russia, actually. Border. Within within the Arctic Circle, yes, you can have uh, a 24-hour day in summer. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy camping in uh, in in the summertime, but not in Finland because it's just all night. Uh, it's all day. Mm -hmm. all night long. Well, that's it. In terms of in disrupting your cycle, you know, your sleep cycle, and everything, that has to play a number. Seasonal on your head of affective disorder is uh, a big area of uh, research there. So maybe your beams of light have to do with being exposed mm. to 24-hour days for so long? <laughs> I, I'll take credit for the focusing and the repurposing of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because you could, you could be at 1 o'clock in the morning and, it, okay, it's starting to get light again. What do you mean, starting to get light? It sounds like it's been light. light. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get a, you'll get a twilight. Uh, oh, it's yeah. not um, very far up. Of course, the sun never will go around the horizon. We'll never dip below it. Okay. But uh, at other places, the sun dips below the horizon for a couple of degrees and comes back up. Well, oh. So it's twilight for a, you're, you get a little twilight. Ooh. Translate that to the, to the winter times, 
you'll get six hours maybe of sun and a lot mm -hmm. of twilight. Societally, do people follow Why the weather shoot patterns? Themselves. Or mm -hmm. Well, they shoot themselves. They, I was told by my uh, amp guru, I, I have a technical mentor there, um, that it would be in the springtime when they would uh, somehow come mm -hmm. over uh, the early spring. It wouldn't be during the darkest of winter. Yeah. Somehow the, uh, the, the timing of it was greater uh, the, around March or so. Uh, hmm. I can see that. Hmm? I can see that. Okay. Well, welcome back to the States. Thank Hi. you very much. <laughs> I appreciate the, the diurnal <laughs> periods. Correct, uh, right. correct report. The story is on the website for WPA TV. Thank you for joining us.